You may be seated, and I invite your attention to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I've entitled this message, The Last Words of a Dying Preacher. The Last Words of a Dying Preacher. Now, of course, we know, or you should know, we're talking here about the Apostle Paul when we say uh, the dying preacher. This is the last known recorded uh, words of Paul that we have, this book of 2 Timothy. And so, to me, those words uh, carry amongst it great weight as we consider uh, who's speaking here and who he's speaking to. He's in a He's in a prison cell. He's awaiting his execution. He knows that his time is short. Uh, he's there in Rome. I believe personally that it's his second imprisonment there. He's waiting his execution. It's uh, very different than uh, probably his first. But we know the situation is different no matter what. Uh, nobody's with him there. He's lost all things. Uh, he asked for, you know, later on a coat and some parchments and some books. I mean, he's there. He's dying. He's lost all things. But yet he wants to reach out and he wants to talk and give some words of advice, some words of wisdom to a younger preacher named Timothy. And so he's going to speak to him. He's going to give him some words. And basically he just wants to tell him, you know what? It's worth it all. It's worth it all. Everything I've ever gone through, everything I've ever suffered, it is worth it all. Live for Jesus Christ. I'm here. I'm about to get my head sawn asunder. But you know what? It is worth it all. My family's forsaken me. My friends have left me. I've lost my position. I've lost my wealth. But Jesus is worth it all. And as I thought about and prayed about what to preach here this morning or this afternoon, I thought, you know what? I've got a surgery tomorrow. And if this is my last words, all right, you know, what would I want to say? And it could be, right? It could be. I mean, uh, I was on a hospital visitation. I'm not going to mention any names. My associate pastor and youth director. And uh, he, we had a teenager going under the knife and put, in, put asleep. And he pointed out the fact that a lot of people don't live through that to his mom and grandma, who were very appreciative of that message. <laughs> but here's the thing. Don't do that. <clears throat> but here's the thing. <laughs> Really, in reality, I know I'm a weenie. I know that there's a little bit of fear and anxiety there. But the reality of it is, is every time I preach, I really try to ask myself, what if this is my last message? What if this is the last time I ever get to preach God's Word? Is it, you know, if this is the last word you ever hear me speak, whoops, if this is the last word you ever hear me speak, is this what you're going to want to know me? Is this what I'm going to be want to uh, want to be known for? Is this what I'm going to want to leave you with? Is this the best job I can do for the Lord? And so I actually try to pray about that and think about that uh, every time. I preach the Word of God. This might be my last opportunity to preach the Gospel. It might be my, the last chance to preach the Word of God. Uh, and I want to do my very best, right? Because I don't want to go and meet my Savior doing a, a halfway job or, or just not pleasing Him. And so, really take that into account. But here He is, and we see His words of wisdom. Many times... Uh, these words are words that we'll hear. This is a sermon very similar to something you might hear at an ordination of a preacher. These words are, are used very often. We call it, you know, who's going to bring the charge? And this is the charge. And they go to these verses. And these are words that we should uh, take into advice. And so I'm just going to uh, try to bring you some words of advice uh, that I would have to give to you. And it agrees with what the Apostle Paul's words were uh, to Timothy here. He says in verse 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So here we have the charge. I'll never forget the day I surrendered to preach, uh, hearing the preacher say, preach the word. Preach the Word. Every time I hear that phrase, every time I hear those three words, it sends chills up my spine, so to speak. It makes me want to, guess what? Preach the Word. I don't know about you, but the calling to preach the Word is clear in my heart. The conviction to preach the Word is passionate within my heart. And a preacher must preach, okay? You've been called to preach the Word. you got to preach, if you're not preaching, you're not doing what God called you to do, okay? And you must preach the Word. And you must preach the Word with compassion. 
You must preach it with compassion. Uh, you know, a lot of preachers don't preach with compassion. A lot of preachers just sort of go up there and give a lecture. A lot of preachers just sort of go up and uh, maybe just kind of half-heartedly talk about what they're going to speak on. Now, uh, I had, I've had various... Uh, situations in my life. Uh, I've had people, uh, you know, there was one particular that didn't like the way I preached. He said, well, you get too loud. You just get too excited. You get too loud. A matter of fact, I've preached a sermon and had one person say I get too loud and too excited and another person tell me I didn't get loud and excited enough. The very same sermon. That's when you know it's just right, okay? You got all sides just kind of going, you know, both sides are complaining. You know it's just right, okay? But anyway, uh, I told this guy, I said, you know what? This guy supposedly went to a seminary, supposedly was a man of God, a preacher. He never preached. He never pastored. But he knew a lot more about it than I did. I told him, I said, listen to this. I said, when I preach... I'm not getting up there. If I don't get excited about what I'm preaching, why would anybody else get excited about it? If I'm not excited, if I'm not passionate about what the Lord has done for me, why would anybody else get excited about it? i tell you what happens when I see somebody getting up there just reading the Word of God and just kind of just going through the motions, I usually get pretty distracted. I don't fall asleep much, but I start looking for those squirrels, you know. I start looking, my mind wanders because you know what he's telling me? He's telling me that he doesn't have much conviction about what he's preaching. He doesn't really care about what he's preaching. He doesn't really believe in what he's preaching. So if I was going to tell you something from a, uh, a preach delivery standpoint... And so you need to be passionate about what you're preaching. That doesn't mean you yell at people every day, right? That doesn't mean you yell at them necessarily. It means you've got to have some excitement and passion about your words. As a matter of fact, I believe this, really, we say a lot by how we say it, or maybe sometimes more, we say more sometimes by how we say something than what we say. Part of speech, part of communication is not what we say, but it's how you say it, okay? And we need to be passionate about the Word of God. We need to preach the Word. The word preach means to herald the Word. It means to herald it, right? It doesn't mean to whisper the Word. It doesn't mean to hide the Word. It doesn't mean to, you know what, just kind of be kind of quiet about it and kind of secretly go around. It means to proclaim it, right? Let your voice be heard. Let people know that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world and that He has risen from the grave. We ought to get excited when we know it, when we hear about the empty grave. We ought, it ought to break our hearts when we hear what He suffered and we hear about the cross of Jesus Christ and the blood that was shed for me and for you and for the sins of the world. It ought to get a little bit excited about it. A Bible ought to mean something to us. And he says here, preach the Word. Right? Not man's philosophy, not jokes. It's got to be the Word. And to preach the Word with conviction, you got to believe that you have the Word. You got to believe that this King James Bible is the Word of God. And there's a lot of difference between believing it is the Word of God and that it contains the Word of God. It's a great difference. When I read my Bible, I know that I'm reading God's words. I know it's not up to any private interpretation. I know that I don't have to have special, uh, you know what, I have to have this special knowledge or uh, be smarter than everybody else to come to the truth or have to be more spiritual. I can read the Bible and it means and it says what it says, okay, uh, so to speak. It does. And we need to understand that when we read the Bible. And what I'm getting at with some of this is there's some people out there in our world today, they would never use a thought for thought translation of the Bible, and yet they don't believe we even have the words of God. They believe we just have the thoughts of God. Well, my Bible tells me that heaven and earth shall pass away, but His Word shall never pass away. That is each and every word. The Bible says, Jesus said that the Scripture cannot be broken. That word Scripture in the Greek means grapho. That means the very written Word of God can never be broken. And so when I read the Word of God, I can be compassionate about what I'm preaching because I believe I'm preaching God's Word. I'm not making up what I'm preaching. I'm not preaching my opinion. I am preaching thus saith the Lord. So I don't have problems preaching passionately. I don't have problems preaching with conviction. I don't have problems knowing where I stand because I am getting what I am delivering from God and from His Word. 
Okay? It, that is from God. And so we need to have convictions about the Word of God. A matter of fact, uh, he starts off verse 1 where he says, I charge thee therefore. He's told Timothy, he's told him, you're gonna, you know what? Times are going to get bad. There's perilous times shall come. Evil seducers shall wax worse and worse. And think about that for a second. Paul is in prison in a lonely pit awaiting to die under the rule and reign of Emperor Nero who was a murderer and a torturer of Christians, if you remember him. And Paul says, it's going to get worse, Timothy. It's going to get worse. And so there he is, and he says, you know what? He talks about, you know what? People are going to fall away. People are going to depart from the truth. And he tells them the way you can stand, the way that you can keep from compromising, the way that you can stand against temptation, the way you can stand against all the false doctrine, the way you can stand against the persecutions and the trials of life. And he says, the way you can do that is with the Word of God. It's the Word of God. That's why he said, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. That's the reason he tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3. You just go up there a couple of verses. In verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All of it. Old Testament and New. Okay? Every bit of it. Timothy's almost dead. They've already got most of the Word of God at this point. I mean, Paul's almost dead. They've got almost all of this Word of God by now. His letters are in circulation. Paul said that his writings are Word of God. They are the Scriptures. They are God's Word. Other uh, Peter recognizes his writing as God's Word. Paul recognizes Luke as, as, as God's Word at one place. They have the Word of God. And he, when he says Scriptures, he doesn't just mean Old Testament. He doesn't just mean Old Testament here, okay? A matter of fact, these letters that he was writing and so forth, it was in circulation. Not only did they have these letters in circulation, they had Holy Spirit gifts. And those Holy Spirit gifts were given to confirm that those writings and the things that they were preaching were indeed God's Word. That's one way we know that the New Testament is God's Word, right? That's one way we know that these Scriptures were not canon and those Scriptures were canon because those early believers, not only are they contradictory, but those early believers had spiritual gifts that revealed that those Word was God's Word. They had all those things in these days, okay? And so he says, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Everything we need, folks, everything we need is right here in the Bible. Everything we need in ministry, everything we need in our life, that we might be complete, is right here in the Bible, where we may be Truly furnished. Truly furnished. You know, I like this. Colton liked it. Y'all might not like it. I like my King James Version. I like where it says, truly, rather than thoroughly. I like that word. I like that word. You know what? You can spray me with water. You can spray me thoroughly. But I can get a sponge. I can get a sponge and spray that sponge, and it's going to get soaked thoroughly. That's why, it's a, I, that's why I like that word, Right? I like the word throughly, through and through. You're going to be completely filled with everything you need from the Word of God. Not just an outward covering, but through and through, permeating your entire soul. The Word of God is what you need so that you can be furnished for everything you're going to need and face. And so he says, preach the Word because there's coming a judgment day. He says right here, before the God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead is His appearing in His kingdom. Preach the Word because you know what? Lost sinners about to go to hell. They need Jesus Christ. Preach the Word because people are departing from the truth. They're departing from the truth. They're going into error. Their life is in shambles. Their life is robbing God of honor and glory. They're, they're losing their testimonies. Therefore, other people are not being saved. And they're going to have to face judgment for that one day. Preach the Word because you know what, preacher? You're going to give an account. You're going to give an account for how you pastored your churches. You're going to give an account for how you lived your life. You're going to give an account for how you preached the Word. You're going to face the Almighty Judge, and He is coming. So He gives him some parting advice. Preach the Word. You're a preacher. Preach the Word. Be instant in season and out of season. You know how I've always kind of heard people say that. You know, Brother Colton, you better bring a message because, uh, you know what, Brother Chet might get a stomach ache. And you got them preach. Well, 
that's not exactly what that phrase means, okay? I, I understand that. You can kind of throw that in there, I suppose. But really the idea of being uh, taught there is in favorable conditions and in unfavorable conditions, right? Preach the Word, whether people receive it or reject it, whether they amen it or omit it, right? Whether they love you or whether they hate you, whether they want to, you know what, thank the Lord for you, or whether they want to kill you and torture you. You preach the Word, whether it's from the pulpit or whether it's from the prison. Preach the Word. At all times, preach the Word. You don't, you know what, you don't check the winds to see what the conditions are, right? You don't wait and see if, the fa if everybody wants to hear it, or you don't ask for an opinion poll. What does everybody want to hear in this community? So, you know what, we might grow. You preach the Word of God. You're not asking for these things. In season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Reprove speaks of the convincing nature of, of preaching. Rebuke speaks of the correcting nature of preaching, right? Both are involved. We preach in a way that, you know what, it hurts. We call out sin. We call out sins. Sometimes Paul called out different people's sin. He call, you call out sins, you preach in a way that convicts uh, through the Holy Spirit of God, and then you show them how to correct it, right? Then you exhort them. That's encouragement, right? It's not just a preaching a correction. It's not just getting on to somebody, so to speak. It's to lift them up and to encourage them on how they should live with all long suffering. Preachers got to have patience. They got to have patience, and they have to have patience for a long time sometimes. And they've got to do it out of love. So you need to have patience for your congregation, right? You got to love them when they don't listen to you. You got to love them when they don't care about what you're saying. You got to love them when they don't agree with the truth of God's Word and seem to be rejecting God's words because in reality they're really rejecting God, not you. Like the Lord told the prophet Samuel. Remember that? He says, they haven't rejected you, Samuel. Really they're rejecting me. And so we got to preach with long suffering. We need to preach with patience. We need to preach with doctrine. Because if we're not preaching with doctrine, what are we preaching with? We're not. We're just preaching man's thoughts once again. Verse 3. We see the charge. And now I want to talk about the challenge. It says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap themselves, teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. He says, it's going to get worse. Now listen, has it got worse than Paul's time? Maybe not for us. Maybe not for us. But he says there's going to come a time maybe where what he's talking about here is not necessarily the persecution, which is going to get worse. He says what's going to get a wor worse is a time in history where people who are professed, born-again believers, don't listen, don't care, don't like and even leave the truth of God's Word. Now, I am a believer that we are in those times. I believe we're in those times. I call it we're in the last of the last days is what I call it. I believe we're in those days. We're in those days where people don't want to hear the Word of God. They are turning away from the truth. Many people who used to serve God faithfully in missionary Baptist churches have completely dropped out of church, completely fallen away from the Lord, don't care about the Lord, don't want to hear about the Lord, don't want to go to church. And then there's another large group of people that grew up in scriptural churches that are going to everything in the world uh, that call themselves a church, but they don't teach any true doctrine, or they teach false doctrine in many areas. We're living in those times, a time of itching ears. A time of itching ears. A time where people want to hear a message that pleases what they want to hear. A time where somebody will tickle people's soft ears. A time where that will be tickled. A time where people will teach something that does not offend. Now, here's the thing, preacher. You're going to be tempted to compromise the truth, but you can't do that. You're going, to be tr tr you're going to be tempted to water down your message, to soft soap the message so that you don't run people out, so that you can have a big congregation, you know, so that uh, you won't offend anyone. Matter of fact, somebody might tell you, well, preacher, you can't, you don't need to preach that. That might offend you. I've had that said. 
They might cut your sermons off the internet. I've had that done, <laughs> right? I ain't go, we don't want nobody to hear that one, okay? That's happened before, okay, in my ministry. Those things are going to happen, and you're going to have, that's going to be a very real temptation. You're going to see other so-called churches down the road, and you're going, to, you're going to want to be like them. And you're going to say, what are they doing? And you're going to say, well, man, they're, they, they just preach encouraging words. That's they just did preach encouraging words. What about the reprove and the rebuke, okay? And so there's going to be a great temptation. He says there's going to be a time when they will not endure. And I found that interesting. Not only there will be a time they won't listen, but there's going to be a time they won't endure. You know, I believe a few years back, maybe a couple decades back ago, people would not listen, but they would endure. They would endure. For example, uh, people would, you would preach, a preacher might preach upon the sins of alcohol, for example, and people would just not listen. They would just ignore, right? They'd just go do their drinking, their partying on Friday, Saturday night, and they'd just ignore. But now we're in a point when you preach on something like that, not only uh, can they not in, ignore it or listen to it, but they cannot even endure it. They don't even want to hear it. They can't put up with it. So they get upset. They go down to a mission, another missionary Baptist church down the road. The preacher preaches the same thing, right? And then they go down to the Methodist church, right? doesn't matter if they're off on security or off on salvation. They can go over there and they don't have to worry about somebody preaching on drinking. All right? Their favorite sins, not being offended. And so it's okay there. Their itching ears can endure such things. So he says there's coming a time when they cannot endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. You know, that has the idea of exactly what I'm talking about. They turn away their ears from the truth, and they turn unto fables. What's that word fables mean in the Greek? Mythos. mythos. You ever heard of mytho, mythogenesis? <laughs> Mythohistorical genesis? Uh, genesis is a fable? Okay. Well, the Bible says be careful about those folks, all right? The Bible makes it very clear. Don't. Uh, the Bible's not filled with any cunningly devised fable or myth, okay? The Bible is filled with God's Word, God's truth. So be careful of those folks. But people will turn away from the truth to something that's not true. They do it every Sunday. Now, here's what I want to warn you of. As time goes on, I truly believe that some of you will see things I haven't seen. <laughs> Starting to get older, I guess, right? Where's, it gonna, where's the work going to be 20 years from now? Where's the work going to be 40 years from now? I don't see it getting any better. You know, I don't want to be, I, I'm not trying to be negative. I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm not saying you can't have a great and prosperous uh, ministry. I'm not saying that you can't lead many, many people to the Lord. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, be prepared, because persecution may come. Be prepared, discouragement will come, right? And every time you get discouraged, every time you face opposition, preach the Word. Preach the Word. That's the only thing that's going to help you stand. That's the only thing that's going to help your ministry and your church stand is preach the Word. And to preach the Word, you've got to get in the Word, right? You've got to get in the Word. My final uh, thing I want to talk about here is the caution in verse 5. It says here, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. He says here to watch in all things. You think, well, couldn't you get a little more specific? Well, all things means what? All things. Now, what are the all things? Well, I like to think about it like this. You know, I like my old westerns. Y'all love old westerns, right? I love my old westerns. Where are the Indians going to attack? Right? Where the guards are not on duty. Where is the wolf going to attack the sheep? Where the shepherd's not. Where you're not watching. Where there's no watch set. Okay? So it's imperative that we watch in all things. Now that, as Brother Jerry Carter would say, loads our wagons. Okay? It's, that's a hard thing to do. But we got to be watching at all times. We got to be 
paying attention. We got to take this in, uh, be serious about it, be vigilant. The Lord is, and let me tell you, um, the devil is attacking in certain areas right now. One is doctrine. Doctrine. You better know what you believe and why you believe it. Not just because Brother Chet said it. Not just because Mom and Daddy said it. Not because that's what the ABA doctrinal statement says. You better know what you believe and why you believe it. Doctrine. Another area, morals. Morals. The devil atta is attacking in our area of morals. He's, he's attacking uh, uh, us in the areas of sexual immorality. He's attacking us in those areas. He's attacking us in areas of materialism. Materialism, material things, material gain, material desires uh, above even the things of God. And he is attacking in the area of pride. In the area of pride. Those are just three areas I could mention that are uh, kind of explain a lot of things as mentioned in 1 John 2.15. But those areas are areas in which we need to be on guard for at all times. We need to watch in all things. The, I'll tell you another area while I'm there. Well, no, I'll, move, I'll get it later. Maybe. Endure afflictions. Notice the difference between a carnal Christian... And a Christian that, and a preacher, and what a spiritual Christian can do. In verse 3, it says they won't endure. You kind of see a play of words here. They won't endure sound doctrine. But listen, if you're saved and you're right with God, not only can you endure sound doctrine, but you can even endure the afflictions. You can even endure the afflictions. Notice the difference between the two. He says, do the work of an evangelist. That's a soul winner, right? Preachers need to be soul winners. It doesn't mean, it's not talking about a different office here, I might say. He's not saying a different office. He's not saying be a professional evangelist. He says, you as a preacher, you need to do the work of soul winning and make full proof of thy ministry. Make full proof. That means to guard your ministry. That's some of those things I've already spoken about. You need to guard your ministry, guard your testimony. And I'm going to throw this there and make sure at this time you need to guard your marriage. Right? You need to do the best you can to guard your marriage. Satan will try to silence the message. He will. He'll try to silence the message. If that doesn't work. He tries to silence the messenger. And one of his most effective methods to silence the messenger is to attack the messenger's wife and children. Okay? So be aware. Make full proof of the ministry. Do the best you can to guard your marriage uh, and guard your ministry. So, in conclusion of this, there's two things that really stand out to me in 2 Timothy that really stand out in these verses. One is the importance of God's Word. It is, the God's Word, it is vital, right? God's Word is vital. That's what it's all about. And the second one is this, the importance of God's man. The importance of God's man. You see, I don't want to belittle anybody else's position between the Lord. But the Bible says, where there is no vision, the people perish. That's talking about it where there's no, where there's no word of God, where there's no prophetic word from God. That's what that word vision means there. It's not talking about, well, you know, I got a vision to build a building. That's not what that means in the Hebrew. Okay, What it's referring to is where there's no Word of God, basically. Where there's no man of God. How can people be saved if there's not a preacher? The Bible tells us. Okay, The office of the man of God, and by the way, it's man of God. Always a man of God. Right? It's important. What God's called you to do is a ministry like none other. It's an important ministry. Don't ever lose side of that. Value your calling. Value your calling. Remember the importance of your calling, the importance of guarding your ministry, that people are watching you, that the devil is attacking you, that, no, that, that a lot of times you're facing things that maybe your peers who aren't called, you're facing things that they don't face. You're facing attacking that they're not going to face. Remember, there must be the Word of God. You must preach the Word. Preaching the Word of God, being the man of God, it's not about us. It's not about us, right? And so we need to guard the ministry. We need to do the very best we can. 
because there is so much at stake. There is a cause. Preaching of the Word of God is what's going to make a difference in lives. It's what's going to see people get saved. It's through what? That people are saved? The preaching of the Gospel. Preaching of the Gospel people are saved. It's going to help people to face temptations and the battles they're facing. It's going to, the Bible says in Ephesians 5, it's what keeps the church cleansed is the preaching of God's Word. It's what's going to help people stay and keep from, keep from flooding into the hoopla, as Brother Crane calls it. Keep from going into all this false doctrine that's out there. It's the Word of God and the preaching of the Word of God. So, I don't know how I did, but I'll tell you this. That's my advice, right? If you never see me again, if this is the last message I ever preach, preach the Word. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly